Okay, should we just get started as people join? Um, hi everyone, I'm Archie Pollam. Um, I'm here with Jenna Khan um, uh, and um, welcome to our second to last Rover 2.0 session of the year. Um, we'll introduce the, we'll have the panelists introduce themselves shortly, but I um, just wanted to um, also um, introduce everyone to Nav uh, Sandu, who's our coordinator and helping us run this. Um, so we are looking forward to our breast panel, uh, breast cancer uh, panel today. Um, we have three panelists who will be going over three breast cancer cases. Um, can you go to the next slide, Nav? Um, and uh, before we start, just wanted to go over. Um, so uh, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a chat function. If you have questions for the panelists about uh, any of the cases, um, just uh, um, please put it in the chat box. Make sure it's addressed to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your question and benefit from the answer. Um, we'll try to have um, some time in between the cases as well as at the end of the session um, for questions, but um, please feel free to uh, put in the questions throughout the session. Um, anything else, Jenna, that we need to go over? No? Okay, so uh, maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Corbin from Mayo, um, if you can uh, tell the group a little bit about yourself. Sure. So um, I'm Kim Corbin. I've been practiced at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm coming up on six years here, which went by super fast. Um, I'm the program director for the residency program, and I have a specialized uh, breast cancer practice where essentially I just take care of breast cancer patients with a little bit of ocular melanoma on the side. Should I pass that off to somebody else for the next intro? Dr. Jimenez. Uh, sure. So, hi, I'm Rachel Jimenez. I am um, a radiation oncologist at Mass General Hospital and the associate program director for our residency program. Um, my practice also specializes in breast cancer with a little bit of coronary brachytherapy on the side. Um, and um, I also participate in the Rover 2.0 group. Dr. Evans. Thank you guys for having me. I'm Sue Evans. I'm a radiation oncologist at Yale. Um, I would have to go with the theme of my practice being entirely breast cancer um, with a focus in safety as well on the side. So looking forward to the discussion today. Um, and uh, Nav, you're taking care of our sign language crew. Wonderful. We'll start with the first case, Dr. Corbin. All right, I have the first case. Um, you can go to the first slide. Um, so this is a 47 year old woman who presents with a screening mammogram detected area of asymmetry on the right. She was brought in for diagnostic imaging and that area of asymmetry was found to be persistent. She also had an axillary ultrasound that showed a few lymph nodes with cortical thickening on the right side. Her physical examination at the time showed no palpable findings within the right breast, but the two, there were two to three small mobile palpable lymph nodes in the right axilla. And she had no pertinent prior medical history. Um, she was employed as a social worker, so she has some connection with healthcare. She's a lifelong non-smoker. Uh, in terms of family history, um, she did have a family history that included some malignancy, kidney cancer at a young age and a brother, uterine cancer in a mother and a father with colon cancer, as well as uh, some breast cancer in maternal grandmother and aunt. Um, so um, this is a representative view of her mammogram. I think you can see that there's some um, thickening in the upper outer aspect of the um, right breast. You can also actually see the enlarged lymph nodes kind of along that pectoralis uh, area here. Uh, she had a biopsy that showed invasive lobular carcinoma. It was grade two uh, hormone receptor positive both for both ER and PR, HER2 negative. She also underwent an FNA of the right axilla, which was positive um, for involvement. Based on her family history and her presentation, she had genetic testing performed, which showed uh, no pathogenic mutations. She did have a variant of VUS detected in the NF1 gene, but not felt to be uh, relevant to this case. 
Um, so I have my first poll question here. Um, so we have a 47 year old woman with a new diagnosis of node positive invasive lobular breast cancer. Um, what would be recommended for further evaluation? MRI of the breast, systemic staging, both or neither? All right, so it looks like most people would recommend both systemic staging and MRI of the breast. That is what this patient had. Um, I thought this would be a nice opportunity to talk uh, with the panelists about when do you use MRI of the breast for newly diagnosed um, breast cancer patients and would it be something you would do in this case? Um, so I can start. Um... So I think this is actually a pertinent question um, that will arise in a case um, that I present next, Kim. So um, I think you and I were thinking similarly. Um, often we think about MRI of the breast here when we're concerned that the mammogram may undercall um, the extent of disease and with lobular cancers and the concern for being mammographically silent. Often um, we do get an MRI because we wanna see if there's a better extent of cancer than what we can appreciate. Um, if this were a ductal cancer, I'm not entirely convinced we would have reflexed to um, getting a breast MRI um, unless there was something else about her case that the radiologist thought was concerning. So um, Connecticut's a little funny, right? So Connecticut has a dense breast law that means that at the bottom of every letter that goes home to patients on their mammogram, if they're determined to have dense breasts, they have something specifically saying that um, you know you have dense breast tissue and so therefore you should get an MRI or an ultrasound as mammogram may not be adequately effective for you. Um, so as a consequence, um, we at Yale have gotten extremely good at whole breast ultrasound and screening whole breast ultrasounds. So between tomosynthesis and whole breast ultrasound, um, we don't rely on MRI as much, um, but it is certainly something um, that we think about in labular cancers for sure. Um, and also I personally love it for the axilla. Yeah, it sounds like our practices are probably fairly similar. I would say the other time that we consider um, MRI more frequently for breast cancer is if we think the patient's going on a path of neoadjuvant therapy and we really want to track their response to treatment um, with that additional imaging. Great. Um, the other question I had uh, relevant to that, um, uh, just in terms of systemic staging, does your institution prefer a certain type of systemic staging um, based on histology? Um, and I guess that's a bit of a guess what I'm thinking question, um, but I know um, for, for some of our patients with um, hormone receptor positive lobular cancers, there's always concern as to whether they'll be FDG avid. And so um, I'm wondering if you prefer PET scan or a CT with bone scan for those patients. Um, so we typically get um, a CT and bone scan for our patients when we stage them just because that's what NCCN guidelines indicate, though we have seen a more recent trend of breast medical oncologists ordering a PET scan. Um, I think in the case of a lobular cancer, we probably would err on the side of just CT and bone scan. Um, but I, I, I think there is a bit of a scope creep in terms of um, seeing more patients staged with FDG PET than what we saw before, despite the fact that the guidelines don't incorporated as a recommendation. So um, I will say as well with Dr. Jimenez that we do CT scan and bone scan. Um, one comment that I'd like to make just to think about is the nice advantage of the PET. Um, usually when our medical oncologists order CT scan and bone scan, they order chest and abdomen. Um, and having seen Dr. Corbin's slides, I know she's about to tell us uh, something about her axilla. So, you know, with, with lots of nodes positive, it's nice to be able to see a little bit more of the neck to, to completely finish staging. Um, so that is one of the advantages um, of either having your practice order a CT neck, um, which probably isn't important for everybody, but for some of these cases, certainly. Um, and if you have a pet, then you do have that, you know, at least anatomic information to some degree. Great. 
Uh, I would say that in our practice, um, we do order probably a fair amount of PET CT scans for initial staging evaluation for breast cancer, although we have seen some resistance from uh, insurance companies, probably based on the NCCN guidelines. Um, I do think there are advantages, like Dr. Evans pointed out, but I will say that there is concern, or at least we've seen anecdotally, uh, that lobular cancers may not be as FTG avid. Um, I'll show you, I think that this patient did have a PET scan, but it was performed initially outside of Mayo Clinic. And I think if she were uh, scanned here, it probably would have been a CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis, and bone scan. Um, so uh, the MRI scan that we ordered um, showed that there was a concern for a satellite lesion on the right side. It's a little bit hard to, to convey that with a single slice uh, MRI view, um, but there was concern uh, for potentially a little more disease than expected uh, on the right breast. And then on the left breast in this um, panel um, on the right side, there was an indeterminate area noted. Uh, she had further evaluation of that by ultrasound, which was negative, but the combination of um, more uh, disease than expected on the right side, as well as this uh, indeterminate finding on the left side and her family history uh, kind of prompted the patient uh, towards um, pursuit of bilateral mastectomy. You can go ahead. Um, so here's that PET CT scan. There was a modest amount of uptake along the upper outer aspect of the right breast and in the lymph nodes uh, on the right side. Um, so she did elect for bilateral mastectomy with right axillary lymph node dissection, and she had a left sentinel lymph node biopsy as would be standard for a prophylactic um, procedure on the, the left side. Uh, in terms of pathology on the right side, she was found to have invasive lobular carcinoma. It was actually ended up being just unifocal grade two, two centimeters uh, in size without associated DCIS. Uh, surprisingly, based on the preoperative imaging, she had 20 of 25 lymph nodes positive, the largest of which was a macro metastasis with greater than two millimeters of extranodal extension. So a fair amount of, um, of um, burden. And then on the left side, the left breast uh, showed benign um, breast tissue. However, um, sentinel lymph node biopsy on the left side showed uh, three of three uh, lymph nodes were positive for cancer. Um, the largest was a six millimeter deposit, I'm sorry, the largest was a 16 millimeter deposit. There was one with 1.5 millimeters and the third was six millimeters without extranodal extension. Right. Um, so this patient uh, went on to receive adjuvant chemotherapy, which I don't have uh, in the slides here, but based on her lymph node burden and age, it seems appropriate. Um, she um, now is in the situation where we need to make a recommendation. Um, so the questions are, um, just for discussion, would anybody consider additional workup for this patient at this time, or do we feel like it's complete because she's had systemic staging? I guess that's a little bit of a guess what I'm thinking question. Um, I wonder um, if uh, your institution does any procedures, especially uh, when there's a, a lymph node detected on the contralateral side to consider whether this comes from the same tumor um, or from an occult primary tumor. Um, so, um, so our pathologists carefully review the lymph node involvement and make sure that morphologically it looks similar. They repeat the staining generally to make sure that there isn't a separate um, primary tumor. Um, but now uh, here's the, the poll question. Um, so should this patient be treated with radiation therapy? And the choices were, uh, yes, uh, the path of threat is likely lymphatic and this represents an extension of local therapy. No, this is stage four um, or unsure. And I wonder um, what you and the panel would do at your institution. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go first again, Sue. Um, so, I think that we, we do see patients like this. Um, they always generate a lot of discussion in our tumor board about the best way to manage them. Um, I think had the patient not had a breast MRI at the time of diagnosis, we would have ordered one at this point just to rule out any occult primary in the opposite breast. Um, but in terms of having rigorous path review to confirm the pathology looking similar to that on the right side, we definitely would have done that. And then I think um, the discussion typically at this point comes to us and says, you know, how much can you cover? How much can you safely treat? Um, and is this a patient that we could try to treat definitively and achieve some type of long-term local control um, or not? Um, and so 
I think it looks like based on the responses from the poll, a lot of people would attempt to treat her definitively. And I think that would be our, our first, first thought as well. Yeah, so, you know, I think one thing I'd sort of um, go back to as well is just sort of touching base with the patient. Was there anything surgical that they didn't mention that could have disrupted lymphatic flow, drainage of the breast in any way, shape or form? Was there any sort of breast surgery? I mean, presumably you would have seen something on physical exam, um, you know, that that may account for altered drainage. Um, you know, sometimes we'll see this in, in the recurrent setting and then you'll really, you know, wonder and worry about, you know, cross drainage. Um, cross drainage has certainly been described, you know, like Dr. Jimenez mentioned, this is always a hot topic um, in, in a tumor board and, you know, the literature suggests that maybe there's around a 30% long-term disease-free survival for these women. So I would say that we would err on the side of treating this as, extended local disease. Yeah, that's kind of uh, the discussion that we usually have too. And I will say that it's not always uh, without contention. I think uh, sometimes depending on the biology and patient age and other factors, um, there are a lot of considerations uh, that go into making that decision. Um, I think we're local therapists, so we tend to want to give the patient the benefit of the doubt and to do something that we think is technically feasible. Um, Dr. Evans raises a good point about contralateral axillary metastasis and this being more common in the setting of um, aberrant lymphatic uh, drainage pathways. So um, I think when you look in the literature, um, when this presents about two thirds of the time, it's in the recurrent setting and only about a third of the time, kind of depending on the case, is it a de novo presentation, but it's certainly unusual. The times that I've seen this uh, happen, it is in a situation like this where there's a fair amount of uh, axillary burden. So you could imagine that the, that lymphatic uh, drainage is just really looking for an alternative path. Um, and so um, I don't think I've seen a contralateral axillary lymph node metastasis with a new diagnosis of breast cancer that didn't have either bulky lymphadenopathy or some prior history uh, that would account for aberrant drainage. Um, so I think we can go on. All right, so I um, work at a center that has protons, which is uh, fantastic for treating um, bilateral um, post-mastectomy uh, radiation. Um, so this patient was treated with definitive um, intent uh, in terms of uh, receiving adjuvant radiation therapy after completion of chemotherapy. And uh, we have found that proton therapy is very attractive for the situation, and it's really challenging to uh, treat these patients uh, using photon-based techniques without exceeding uh, cardiac or pulmonary doses. Um, we typically position these patients in the arms down uh, when feasible, and that's really for comfort. Um, so proton therapy takes some time to deliver. This type of proton therapy plan uh, is fairly complex and generally for fields, um, which uh, between the setup accuracy and waiting for beam time can take about 30 to 45 minutes to deliver. That's a long time for patients to have their arms up. Um, we typically uh, use a mask for immobilization and we create a custom immobilization um, for their uh, arms as well. Um, we generally acquire the scans uh, free breathing as uh, the cardiac and pulmonary sparing is adequate with the proton therapy. Um, when we treat bilateral cancers with proton therapy, um, there's always a question about contouring the CTV and whether it should cross mid midline. Um, in this type of situation where we're uh, covering for uh, aberrant lymphatic uh, drainage, it's usually in our practice to have the CTV cross midline and to cover that space uh, in that location. If we felt that we were treating two separate primary tumors, then we would see a gap in that location. Anybody have questions or comments about the proton therapy? I'm gonna show you the DBH on the next slide. Dr. Corbin, I just wanted to make sure that the residents noted that you also did inclusion of bilateral IM nodal changes, chains as well. Yes. This makes sense given this extensive nodal disease. All right, so on the next slide, um, I think I show comparison DVHs, um, comparing uh, what we were able to achieve with the um, proton therapy DVH on the left side compared with a photon IMRT comparison on the contralateral side. 
So the cumulative V20 um, for the total lung was 11% with the proton therapy plan with a total lung a mean of 7.2 gray and a mean heart dose of 0.8 gray. Those are really fantastic numbers compared with what's achievable with an IMRT plan. And I would say that I think 3D would be really technically not feasible without something very fancy when you're covering the bilateral and internal mammary uh, nodes. Um, but the cumulative V20 was over 30% with an IMRT comparison. And you can see there's, uh, you know, the ipsilateral, um, I'm sorry, the cumulative V5 of the lung is 100%. Mean lung dose is more than double at 18 gray. And our mean heart dose was almost 10 gray. So we felt that this was a patient who would substantially benefit from um, particle therapy. And so uh, that is what we chose for her. There are a few questions that have come in. Um, is the chest wall in the contour? Um, and could you sh show or kind of explain the beam arrangements for the proton plan? Uh, I don't think I have a great way of showing it since these are prepared slides, um, but um, typically the beam arrangement for proton therapy plan includes something that's almost akin to an on FOSS and then uh, at a little bit of an angle. Um, so um, we kind of, we can come at the, treatment kind of like this, um, depending on uh, the exact uh, proton therapy machine and whether you have a half gantry or kind of the technical set, uh, the technical arrangements. Um, the chest wall, um, so we tend to follow the, um, the uh, CTV definition uh, that includes um, the pectoralis space uh, and the interpectoral lymphatics, but we don't include the rib and intercostal spaces uh, in general when we're contouring our CTV. Um, and that's really based on, I think, um, I think Sushil Berrywal and some others have kind of put out the CTVs that uh, demonstrate where we see local recurrence in the setting of uh, locally advanced breast cancer. And it's really not very common to see a recurrence um, in the uh, intercostal space. Um, so I typically actually don't include that. And I don't know if that differs for Rachel or Sue. And so we, we do something similar, um, essentially adhering to the RAD comp breast contouring atlas where the intercostals and the ribs are excluded. Um, and we would have done probably something quite similar here um, for this, this patient. Um, the only thing I was going to point out in terms of beam arrangement is that different proton centers will use different types of beam arrangements. So um, what Dr. Corbin is talking about is a four field plan. If this patient had been treated here, she likely would have received two fields of protons. Um, again, both on FOSS, um, but as a single field to each side of the chest wall. Um, and there are advantages and disadvantages of each and, and have a lot to do with the, the specifications of your gantry and um, field size. Um, but just to know that it's not um, uniform that everyone would receive proton therapy in exactly the same way. Along those lines, if proton therapy isn't available, um, would breath hold VMAP be considered? Yeah, I mean, I think if proton therapy weren't available, that I would certainly breath hold this patient uh, for treatment. And I think it's technically really not possible to treat a patient like this without using some kind of advanced planning technique like IMRT VMAT um, if you don't have access to proton therapy. This is the kind of patient where I think, um, I, I hope that we can establish good referral networks for proton therapy, just given these uh, differences that we're seeing. But I recognize that it's not feasible for some patients, either financially, logistically, or otherwise. And I, I don't think that the numbers that we're seeing on the right side are unsafe, but I think that they are associated potentially with some higher risk of long-term toxicity. Great. For time, we should probably move forward to the next case. There are some questions in the chat that perhaps you can answer during. Okay. Um, did we want to answer that question or just move on to the second case? I thought they were asking me to just respond in the chat, but I'm open to doing whatever. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, okay, so um, this second case is a bit of a departure from um, the complexity of what Dr. Corbin presented. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is a 40-year-old woman um, who had no prior mammograms, and she felt a lump in her left breast after getting her COVID vaccine in the left arm. Um, so she had a breast exam that demonstrated two discrete mobile masses. 
um, less than two centimeters each at 10 and 12 o'clock in the left breast without overlying skin changes and the right breast was normal um, and there was no palpable adenopathy. Next slide. So uh, diagnostic bilateral mammogram and ultrasound confirmed these two areas at 10 and 12 o'clock um, and core biopsy of both of them uh, showed a grade two ER positive, PR positive and HER2 negative invasive ductal cancer. Next slide. So here's the first poll question. Um, at your institution, would this patient have received any additional imaging at this point? Okay, so it looks like um, kind of evenly split between having a dedicated axillary ultrasound to look for nodal involvement versus having a breast MRI due to the multifocal disease. Um, I'm curious, uh, Dr. Evans, Dr. Corbin, um, if you had any thoughts about how this patient might have been managed at your institution. So I think, um you know, a lot of this, we would have probably been in your final choice, right, at the discretion of radiology, whether or not there are concerns with the limitations of mammography. Um, our, our radiologists routinely, when they, when they find a suspicious mass um, in the breast, um, you know, they will do an ultrasound um, as part of that as well. So, you know, they are getting pretty routinely axillary ultrasounds if there's any sort of abnormality in the breast. Um, and we are doing a lot of whole breast ultrasound, as I mentioned. Um, so typically breast MRI is just, you know, if radiology doesn't feel like they got a great view based on the tomosynthesis mammogram um, and the ultrasound. And I would say that we're probably a little bit more um, liberal in the use of MRI and MRI would probably be considered for somebody where there was multifocal disease, if there was a consideration for conserving surgery or for surgical planning um, and she would get an axillary ultrasound. Um, so I think the only reason I put this question in is because I feel like it is so variable from institution to institution and, and how these patients are managed. Um, I think because this patient was young and there was this question about the COVID vaccine on the left-hand side, it kind of prompted them to do MRI, but I think in the absence of that, they might not have if this patient was a little bit older. Um, okay, next slide. So again, just to hit home the idea that the use of breast MRI can vary quite a bit. Um, this was just um, pulled from the NCCN guidelines about when breast MRI is suggested or indicated. Um, and I just wanted to highlight for the residents that um, it's a category 2B recommendation. So there's a tremendous amount of variability in terms of how institutions utilize MRI. Okay, next slide. Um, so our patient did have a breast MRI, um, and you can see that um, in the left breast, she has a pretty extensive area of non-mass-like enhancement in addition to the tumor. Um, and uh, the image on the right-hand side shows this um, area, this lymph node that looked uh, concerning. Um, and so, next slide. Um, they measured the NME as spanning almost 14 centimeters in the breast, as well as having this prominent left axillary node. So they did a core biopsy of the node um, that just showed reactive tissue. Next slide. Okay, so um, what is interesting about this case is that um, at this point in time, the patient knew that she would require mastectomy given the extensive disease in the breast. Um, but she requested a mammoprint be ordered. So a mammoprint was then sent just on the biopsy specimen. Next slide. So here's my next question. At your institution, would this patient have received genomic evaluation at this phase of treatment? 
So I guess you can see that this is a little bit all over the place in terms of um, what practice patterns are like. Um, and I, I selfishly asked this question because I actually wanted to know what people did. Um, and I'm curious to hear from Dr. Evans and Dr. Corbin how it's handled at your institutions. So um, Dr. Jimenez, we actually did a pilot, Tara Samf, one of our medical oncologists, did a reflex oncotype pilot um, to look at, and this was several years ago, to look at this process. Um, and as a radiation oncologist, we loved it, right? Because the patients would come to us with their T1CN0 breast cancer and it'd be like straight to SIM or you know, see you after your chemo and we'd know and there wouldn't be any back and forth or ambiguity with the patients and it was a patient satisfier in a lot of ways. But unfortunately for the medical oncologists, they had just enough um, settings where they would get a patient who would be you know, four positive nodes or, you know, node positive, and then they would have, or, or, you know, unsuspected, and they would have ordered an oncotype rather than the mammoprint. And, you know, there was less um, certainty about oncotype at that point and, and limited node positive disease that it became quite unpopular. Um, so, you know, and we see this, you know, this is a frequent tumor board thing too, where, you know, this, this will happen, um, and then the patient will be like 35 with 12 positive nodes and, and you know, a, a super, super low risk mammoprint. print. Um, and then it becomes a real management problem trying to convince the patient that they actually do need chemotherapy, that their relative risk reduction may be low, but their absolute risk is huge. Um, and, and so, you know, it's something we tend to shy away from, um, but it does still happen. It's not routine for us for sure. Yeah, I would say that it's not a usual workflow for us to have a mammoth print or oncotype on these patients at the time of diagnosis. Uh, I think um, they occasionally um, are performed um, for extenuating circumstances or as a way to kind of help a patient understand their risk if we're trying to, you know, offer them preoperative chemotherapy, but they're not sure if they want it or things like that. But I would say um, it's not typically used in the upfront setting before the surgery in our practice. Um, and so just as a follow on question to the both of you as part of this discussion, do you typically order Oncotype or do you typically order Mammoprint or are there certain circumstances where you would order one versus another? I think our institution uh, tends to order Oncotype. Um, uh, I know Mammoprint is used on some of the clinical trials. So that's a situation in which um, I usually see that one ordered. I think. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not usually the one doing the ordering, but I'm more accustomed to seeing the Oncotype. So um, we definitely favor Mammoprint if we are using it in the limited node positive setting. Um, you know, we also tend a little bit more towards Oncotype, um, but, you know, my understanding is that there is a little less ambiguity um, with the Mammoprint. Now that's gotten better since, you know, we have um, results showing that even intermediate risk oncotypes don't necessarily have to get chemo. Um, so there's, there's less concern about that. So we do tend more towards oncotype for probably market share, just what you're, we're used to kind of reasons, right? Like that was available first. So that's what we're used to. Yeah. Maybe so it's more complicated than that. Well, at our institution, I think it's the same. We don't typically order mammoprint. So this was an unusual circumstance. We usually order Oncotype. Um, and I think with Taylor, RT, uh, Taylor RX and the RX responder trial and having all this additional data about which patients can forego chemo, I think it's just reinforced the use of Oncotype. Um, so again, I, I tossed this up um, for the residents just so you guys could see um, in the NCCN guidelines how they think about a lot of these genomic tests. Um, and we know that at different hospitals, people will use different things, but um, I think that the advantage of Oncotype over Mammoprint is that um, it has been shown to be predictive and in addition to being prognostic. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so I put this up mainly because um, I think Mammoprints tend to be less common than Oncotypes and I wanted to show what the report actually looks like because many of us who order Oncotypes are, are used to looking at the score and looking at the score cutoffs, you know, less than 18, 18 to 31, 31 and greater, or, you know, 25 or less, depending on what trials you're, you're looking at. Um, but the mammoprint print is actually binary. It's just you have low risk or you have high risk. Um, and so if you have high risk, um, they 
take you through the details of your risk of recurrence if you um, don't receive chemotherapy, um, but it is just a binary result for the uh, patient. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the patient did undergo a left nipple sparing mastectomy, central lymph node biopsy, um, followed by axillary dissection and immediate implant-based breast reconstruction. And her path showed two foci of disease, um, the largest measuring 1.7 centimeters. Um, both were grade two, strongly ERPR positive and HER2 negative, um, and predominantly invasive papillary carcinoma. Um, without LVI or blood vessel invasion and margins were negative. The sentinel lymph node was positive. Um, it measured 0.3 centimeters and the rest of the nodes taken at dissection were negative and there was no extranodal extension. Next slide. So would you recommend that a 40 year old patient with a T1C N1 grade two ERPR positive and HER2 negative invasive cancer after mastectomy and axillary node dissection with a single 0.3 centimeter lymph node receive post-mastectomy radiation. Okay, so it looks overwhelmingly yes. Um, so next slide. Okay, so I'm glad that everyone felt as confident as this. I did not feel this confident. Um, and so I think part of it is because the data tells us conflicting things. And so the reason why I didn't feel very confident about this is because while the EBC TCG meta-analysis, yes, breast cancer mortality and local regional recurrence is, is decreased with the addition of post mastectomy radiation, even amongst patients with one to three positive lymph nodes, resounding yes. Next slide. Everything else says, eh. So there's been a number of studies that have looked at patients with one to three positive nodes and have looked at their risk of local regional failure um, as an isolated event. Um, after mastectomy and definitive chemotherapy. And the risks of local regional failure in these patients are a lot lower than what was seen in the meta-analysis and some of the more um, traditional trials that we look at. Um, and then we have some additional information, again, in the oncotype space, suggesting that the risk of local regional failure in patients, even with a high oncotype, if they have one to three positive nodes, is pretty modest. So um, the Mamunas data there at the bottom would suggest that if you had a high oncotype score with one positive node, your risk of a local regional recurrence at 10 years is still under 10%. So um, this gave me a lot of pause about whether or not this patient should get radiation. Um, and so um, this was made more difficult by the fact that the patient had a mammoprint that was high risk, but we don't have any data on mammoprint and local regional recurrence with and without radiation. Next slide. Um, so the taylor Artis trial, which many of you may be familiar with, is an ongoing trial that's trying to answer just this question, which is patients who are low risk with a low oncotype, limited nodal disease, can they forego uh, post-mastectomy radiation or not? Um, and so I thought this would be a great trial for this patient to go on, um, except that she'd already ordered a mammoprint. So her insurance company would not cover an oncotype and she feared getting a discordant result, meaning paying for the, the oncotype out of pocket herself um, and then finding that it was discordant with the mammoprint and not knowing whether to get chemo or radiation. Um, so next slide. Um, the patient decided to rely on the mammoprint to decide her risk of recurrence and elected to go to chemotherapy. And so without the ability to enroll her on a clinical trial, um, I advise post-mastectomy radiation in this setting. Um, but I'm curious to know what Dr. Corbin and Dr. Evans would have done in this situation, because I think that um, it is not at all clear cut in a patient with such limited nodal disease. So Dr. Corbin, I'm not sure what your understanding is, but I, I feel like the Taylor RT people promised us that if we ordered Oncotype for the trial, that they would pay for it. Has that not actually happened though? Yes, so we were told the same thing, except we, we really ran into it with the insurance company. Um, and so I think there was the concern that she could still get billed 
Yeah, understood. Um, you know, I think I I would agree. I think that um, in the absence of clinical trial enro enrollment, I would do PMRT for her. Um, the thing that that we struggle with is what should your extent of regional nodal radiation be? Um, and so if she has a, you know, an inner quadrant, it's 10 and 12 o'clock, I guess, right? And it was left-sided or right-sided? I don't left. remember. Left-sided. Left. Okay. So, so it was sort of central and, and, and outer quadrant. Um, uh, it was central, central and, and inner. It's central and inner. Yeah. So then she's, she, you're sort of stuck treating her IMs, unfortunately. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, and it feels like a lot, right? It feels like a lot to say, okay, she's got three millimeters of disease. You know, this is somebody who in the old days of, of big axillary dissections and no sentinel nodes, when they would have bivalved the node, you, you probably never would have seen that, right? You just wouldn't have sliced through it and she would have been node negative and mm -hmm. we all would have not done PMRT and been very happy. Um, <laughs> So, but you know, I would, in the absence of a clinical trial, we would have offered her PMRT in with full RNI in breath holds. Yeah, Rachel, I feel like uh, you did a really good job of picking what I would call like the ultimate gray zone case, you know, mm -hmm. where you just like are tormented by whether you should offer treatment to the patient or not. Um, you know, on the one hand, it's hormone receptor positive, and we know that systemic therapy is probably going to go on for 10 years in terms of her endocrine therapy. Um, and she has a very small deposit and a negative completion dissection. Um, she's not high grade, there's no LVI. On the other hand, it's mama print high and she's 40. Um, so I think um, the way that I would approach this um, in our practice, I think it's possible that the patient might have been spared the lymph node dissection. We might have got a call from the operating room and uh, talked with the surgeons about whether we would offer post mastectomy radiation and maybe they would have paused um, so that we could have that discussion um, before uh, they, they proceeded. Um, but I would counsel this patient that there's probably a small uh, disease specific survival um, or uh, local recurrence benefit um, to radiation therapy with uncertain overall benefit and kind of the modern era with her risk factors and then discuss the potential downsides of radiation therapy, which in the setting of immediate reconstruction are certainly not uh, insignificant, and then kind of use um, shared decision making to decide whether to proceed with radiation or not. Um, so uh, this is a situation for me where um, I'm certainly offering treatment, but I don't think I'm overselling the potential uh, upsides in light of the potential downsides. Well, thanks. You made me feel a little bit better about, about having offered treatment in this case. Um, and so I agree, Dr. Evans, with what you said about regional nodal irradiation. I saw that was a question in the chat, and I'll answer the other ones as you go with your case. All right. Excellent. Um, so my case is a woman who is 65 years old who had a screaming mammogram. She did not have any palpable mass. She was in her usual state of health with just hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Her social history is significant for having a husband who just got diagnosed with colon cancer um, and surgery was scheduled. Um, and he is on dialysis with end stage renal disease. Um, and on physical exam, we were able to appreciate a palpable mass, but this was also post, bi post biopsy, so unclear if it was really palpable or if I was just feeling hematoma. You can do the next slide. Um, all of her lab work was fine. She had a four o'clock left breast mass, um, which was um, an invasive ductal carcinoma um, with ECAD positive. She was ER 100, PR negative, and HER2 new negative. Um, this particular, we don't routinely do key 67, um, but the, at this um, institution where she was biopsy, they did, and it was 5%. Um, Dr. Jimenez, Dr. Corbin, do you use key 67 in your, with pathology? We do. It's something that I've become pretty used to looking at and, and considering when I'm thinking about the biology of a tumor. But I will say where I practiced before Mayo, we did not. Yeah. And I, my understanding from um, our pathology group is that there is a lot of inter-observer variability about key 67 And there's a lot in the pathology lit literature um, that it is internally consistent. <laughs> but not necessarily pathologist to pathologist consistent. So if you have a small dedicated core group with consensus conference, you probably can compare yourself to yourself, um, but not necessarily yourself to anyone else. Um, 
So ultimately she did go for a lumpectomy and sentinel lymph node biopsy and was found to have a moderately differentiated unifocal two centimeter cancer. She did have a little bit of perineural invasion um, and her initial margins were a little close to the medial, but she went on to have shaved margins. We can go to the next slide. And all of those are clean. We can do the next slide. All right. Um, so I apologize. I wasn't sure if we were going to have a select all that apply option. So I wanted to pull the group on what would be an acceptable management recommendation for this 65 year old woman with a T1C N0 ear positive PR negative, widely margin negative cancer of the left breast. So you can pick whole breast, partial breast, endocrine therapy alone, or no additional therapy. Um, and you can pick any variation of the above. Excellent. Um, so yes, I love these answers that everybody's all over the map and happily no one says she can't skip endocrine therapy and radiation therapy, which I'm very pleased to see. Um, Dr. Jimenez, Dr. Corbin, do you wanna comment about how you might approach this kind of patient in your clinic? If there are any things that would be off the table for you? Um, so I think, you know, a patient like this meets criteria for the prime two study, of course. Um, but um, I tend not to think of that as like the best option, just knowing what we know about patients' long-term adherence to endocrine therapy and the kind of natural history of small hormone receptor positive breast cancers, such that, you know, the risk at 10 years is lower than the risk at 15 years. I mean, I counsel patients 1% per year on endocrine therapy. Um, so I guess um, provided that she's otherwise in good health, I would offer her um, some form of radiation therapy. Um, I think, you know, I have a practice that includes a fair amount of uh, whole breast and partial breast radiation. Um, did your pathology say she had perineural invasion? I wasn't. <laughs> Not not a hundred percent sure, uh, kind of what to make of that. It might give me a little bit of pause about partial breast radiation, just knowing that, like LVI, it's one of those factors that can be associated with local recurrence. But and now that we have uh, ultra hypoxination, we have other ways of accelerating therapy for this patient if she was highly motivated for accelerated therapy. So I guess uh, my best practice recommendation would probably be whole breast radiation, but I would consider partial breast radiation in select circumstances, kind of depending on uh, the patient's, um, you know, specific specific case. Totally agree, 100%. So I wanted the title of ultimate gray zone case because I feel like <laughs> my favorite gray zones are the ones where nearly nothing is wrong. We can go to the next slide. All right, and this is just asking, does anyone have a favorite option? If you had to pick with no input from the patient, what would you do? Excellent. So Dr. Corbin, see how influential you are. <laughs> um, all right, excellent. We'll go to the next slide. So I wanted to um, talk a little bit and get a little bit into the issues of partial breast radiation. Um, so, you know, I think you guys can appreciate, this is actually a, a patient of mine who's currently under treatment. Um, who had a low risk breast cancer and over the age of 70. But unfortunately, after her, her lumpectomy had a fall at home, maybe five days later, and literally like fell on her breast onto a hard object. And so had a large um, hematoma here. Um, but certainly some, some women get this kind of seroma just from surgery, right? Um, and so, you know, the, the issue with this is, you know, this would not be somebody that I would consider for anatomic reasons um, for partial breast radiation, just because it wouldn't be all that partial. Um, and you worry a lot more about fibrosis when you start to have these larger volumes. Um, Dr. Corbin, Dr. Jimenez, do you have any additional comments? <laughs> 
I completely agree with you. I think sometimes this is a hard concept for patients to understand because they strongly desire partial breast irradiation as a way to limit radiation exposure. Um, and it can be a challenging conversation to explain to them that they're not actually limiting their radiation exposure and may be resulting in a worse cosmetic outcome with this kind of a technique. Um, so I think it is important when you're seeing a patient like this, even before SIM, to try to size up whether literally the patient is a good candidate from a size perspective for PBI. Yeah, I agree 100%. I mean, I think a patient like this, I would not offer partial breast radiation to. I would consider re-stimming the patient uh, for their whole breast radiation too, to see if some of that hematoma or seroma resolved uh, before therapy, which I think, you know, considering the trauma in this case, it probably could. Um, I think all the reasons you outlined higher risk for toxicity, uh, just, I wouldn't offer that. Um, I think it's important to work with your surgeons. Um, and, uh, when you have a good working relationship with your surgeons, you'll find that they close a cavity and they place clips and they make partial breasts like really attractive. Um, I do tend to counsel patients who have their surgery elsewhere. If I'm unfamiliar with the surgical techniques or otherwise that I won't know until the simulation, whether they're a good candidate. Yeah, I think that's a great practice. Um, just of note, I also, you know, this, this particular woman, I did whole breast without boost um, because you know I waited a few weeks to to sim her because of exactly what you said, Dr. Corbin. Um, you know, I I knew from clinical exam when I examined her breast, it was visibly bruised. I knew she needed some time for things to quiet down. Um, but yeah, this was someone I I omitted boost because of the low benefit and in my mind the the higher risk. So we can go to the next slide. All right, so what about this patient for partial breast? These are Dr. Corbin's lovely closed cavities with clips delineating the cavity for us. So this lady we can do anything for, right? Partial breast would be very reasonable for her. Um, you know, according to a lot of the partial breast protocols, notably I'm thinking of the Livy Florence IMRT, minimum of four clips placed. I think you can see that here she has at least six. Um, and so that gives our options a lot better. Next slide. All right, um, so I wanted to touch base with the crowd about what their preferred fact fractionation would be. Would they do 5,000 with boost to 60 to 66? Would they do 5,000 and 25 with no boost? Um, this is for your whole br breast crew. Would they do 4,005 and 15 um, or the Whalen fractionation of 16 fractionations um, with a boost or the same without? Would they do the UK fast of 2850 and five once weeklies? Or would they do the UK fast forward in 2600 and five fractions in a week? And this is just what you would favor. So Dr. Jimenez and Dr. Corbin, what are your thoughts? Kind of feels like the cheesecake factory menu, you know, just like keeps going and going. <laughs> um, and so I think it is really a challenge. Um, you know, since the UK fast 10 year data was published um, and COVID has been active, we have offered patients the option of UK fast um, in addition to the UK start wheel and option. Um, and so typically it's a conversation with the patient about that only because the primary endpoint in that trial was not local control um, or ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence. And so I feel an obligation to tell patients that it wasn't powered for that endpoint, um, but we do use it frequently um, as long as patients understand the differences. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I've certainly done all of these things on this page. Um, I would say it's been a while since I used conventional fractionation when whole breast was the target. And my, uh, I think, standard of care right now is usually 15 fractions, although I've become increasingly comfortable with ultra hypo fractionation, the 26 and 5 uh, with the five year publication, kind of with the caveats that, you know, we don't have long term cosmesis. And I do think if you adopt the five fraction, you have to be mindful of the um, kind of more strict heterogeneity constraints that were in the protocol. So I think that's really important. Um, I have actually liked having the once weekly option for some patients who have real logistical challenges for radiation therapy. I'm thinking of older patients who need treatment, but are also caregivers. And, you know, sometimes just the idea of getting a ride and coming once a week is nice for them. I have a patient on treatment right now, or that's the case. So, um, you know, I, I um, try to offer what I think is best for the patient at the time, but I certainly offer any of those. Um, and I can't think of a scenario in which I would do conventional fractionation for whole breast right now. 
Yeah, so that's a great discussion. Um, I would say our practice is the same. I've been very impressed um, with the UK FAST, which has been the regimen we've been using as well with the same caveats that Dr. Dr. Jimenez mentioned. Um, that being said, absolute numbers with a trial of over 900 patients are exceedingly small for local recurrence. Um, so it's hard to imagine that although it wasn't powered for it, um, it was still a measured endpoint and was still very good. Um, but I've been really impressed with the, the tolerance and the skin um, and the patients do really love the five fractions. For me, um, you know, the biggest differentiator is whether or not a woman desires a boost. So I always have a shared decision-making comment about, you know, a lower absolute benefit um, of boost in women who are of a higher age group. Um, and, you know, I get some women who are sort of in for a penny, in for a pound. If they're going to do radiation, they want to do the whole thing. Um, you know, my mentor, Dave Wazer at Rhode Island Hospital would always tell women when he was selling partial breast, you could have five years of endocrine therapy or five days of radiation. Um, and I'm pleased to see that there's starting to be some, some discussion of that um, in the literature that, you know, maybe for some of these smaller, you know, cancers, we don't have to worry about systemic therapy as much. And maybe one day it really will be an option for radiation therapy versus endocrine therapy. Um, but I would agree with Dr. Corbin and I'm sure Dr. Jimenez is the same way as well. I can't remember the last time I did conventional fractionation that's a lie. I do. Um, so when I've had, um, when I've had really, really weird histology cancers, um, I have done conventional fractionation, um, on, on, uh, on some of the strange histology cancers. Um, for instance, like a, a you know, I had like a squame of the breast or something, um, something along those lines. We have not done that. Um, fast forward as much. All right, so if you're gonna do partial breast, what would you do? So I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I, I forgot to put the import low data on here as well, um, which would be 4,005 and 15 to just a mini tangent. Um, so you could do 3,400 centigrade and 10 BID fractions with Bracky, um, 3,850 and 10 BID fractions with external beam, 3,005 once daily fractions according to the Livy IMRT. Florence, would you bring her back to the OR for IORT? All right, excellent. Um, so, you know, I, I would agree with the audience. I think that, um, you know, the import low and the Livy IMRT have been, uh, you know, the two um, external beam options that have shown sort of the best results with cosmesis. Um, so that, you know, tends to be our preference um, when we're looking at that. Um, and in terms of convenience, certainly the five fraction regimen is better. Dr. Corbin, Dr. Jimenez, in the last couple of minutes, you want to say your preferred regimen for external beam IMRT, uh, APBI, excuse me. Uh, so we have a number of um, institutional protocols here that we're using PBI. And so um, with my colleague, uh, Dr. Alphonse Tagan, he had developed a technique using 40 gray and once daily fractions of four gray over two weeks. And so that had been our default until the Florence data was published and then we have switched over. Um, so we're doing the one week treatment as well. Yeah, similarly, we have an institutional um, kind of developed um, treatment schedule using three daily fractions. Um, so we tend to offer that for kind of the more favorable risk um, patients, but I do use the Italian schedule. I personally shied away from the 3850 and 10 BID just based on some of the toxicity data. Um, I think, you know, um, I think it's not as good as some of the other options like import low and the Italian. So I tend to favor those. think we're out of time. So um, thank you to everyone for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists. Um, it was a wonderful discussion. Um, please make sure to fill out the post survey. Um, we have one final session um, next month, which will be um, thoracic malignancies. Um, so please join us for the last rover of the year. Over 2.0 for the year. Thank you.